heard of uh, repentance and uh, from number five. And we got all done with that uh, the other weekend. And so we're going to start number six tonight without going back to anything on number five. Really? Good. Well, we can only start back at one. Yeah. Well, we got so many other good things ahead of us, we don't have time to do that. We're yeah. moving forward. We're moving forward. Thank you. Amen. I thank God tonight for each and every one of you. And uh, again, this this lesson is uh, an ouchy lesson. Um, and I learned, as I said before, from the men at Illinois River. Uh, they taught me years ago, they said, if you can't say amen, just say ouch. You know, because the word of God gets you that way. Yes, yes. We'll begin with a word of prayer tonight, and then we will begin uh, part six, repentance, the importance of. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. We do thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for your love, your the mercy, the grace you give us. We thank you, Lord, for just waking us up this morning and starting us on our way. We thank you, Lord, that your word is that we might know you, but also that we might grow in the love that you have for us. We praise you today, Lord, and thank you, Lord, for each and every one that is here. We thank you, Lord, for Miss Faye, Lord, and, and blessing her, Lord, to see another year. And blessing her, Lord, with, with showers of love, Lord, just getting back what she has already given to others. Now, Lord, open our understanding to your word tonight. Guide us and direct us, Lord, that we might grow, Lord, not in just information or knowledge of Scripture, but the application, Lord how you desire for us to live for you. That we might be an encouragement one to another. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, Lord, give us ears to hear and a heart to receive and the courage to walk it out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Part 6. Um, repentance, the importance of. This part here is reminding us how important it is to come to that place of knowing that we are disconnected from God. These scriptures, a lot of times, we read them in other passages and, and other parts of the study over, over the years that we've been doing this. But tonight we're going to look at it again from just another, uh, uh, another part of what the Word of God has to say to us in the teaching of repentance. And while Paul was waiting at, uh, for Silas and Timothy and Athens, he was troubled because he saw that the city was full of idols. In the synagogue, he talked to the Jews and the Greeks who worship God, and he also talked every day with people in the marketplace. Some of the Epicureans, uh, and I'm glad you're back tonight. Epicureans. Okay. I was close. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Stoic uh, philosophers argued with him, saying, this man doesn't know what he is talking about. What is he trying to say? Others said, he seems to be telling us about some other gods. Because Paul was telling them about Jesus and his rise, raising from the dead. They got Paul and took him to a meeting of the... There are like a spirit of Vegas. Vegas. Areopagus. And it is Areopagus, or Pegasus, but it's Areopagus. Where they said, you know, I'm before I go any further. When I was putting this together, I remember the last time we went to it, you were here at the Bible study. You must have knew that we were going to be doing this here because <laughs> why the last time I had to ask you, how do you say these words? So I thank God tonight for you just being here because you were on my heart. I just started laughing to myself. I said, she was here and, and I would just look at her so she could just give me the words and stuff. So we're glad to have you here. Amen. See what Yes. God is good. He, he knew I would need some help with this tonight. Paul explained to us the new idea you have been teaching. Please explain uh, to us the new idea you've been teaching. The things you are saying are new to us, and we want to know what this teaching means. All the people of Athens and those from other countries who live there always use their time to talk about the newest ideas. 
you know, something hasn't changed in all these years. People are still looking for the newest thing out there. The next thing, the next great thing. They changed the way they looked, they changed the way they talked, they changed the way they walked. We changed the way in the automobiles on how we drive and what we look for in a car, TV, and all those different things. We're always looking for new. Mm -hmm. The kids are going out and they can't wait for the next phone to come out. And I'm still trying to figure out the first phone I got. <laughs> we find themselves, and so here it was, these people were looking for the next new thing. They weren't looking for a change in their life. They weren't looking for how they might grow in a relationship with God or even the gods that they, they worship themselves. But what they wanted to know was, what can you teach me now? So is that teaching without understanding? Is it teaching then that we get all this information but we still don't understand what we have? And so the people there were talking to, to Paul and they were saying, you know, this new thing, all the people of Athens and, and those from other countries who live there always use their time to talk about the newest ideas. The newest ideas. What it means is that it sounds good, it sounds right, I can use it if I want to or I don't have to use it. But when it comes to the things of God, God doesn't give them to us that we would understand that it's something that I might need or I could use. But God gives us his word and gives us his life that we might know how to live in him. And everything that God gives us is good. So it's not about just getting information. It's not about just coming to a place and saying, well, I've read this and I've got all of these things now. It still comes down to what I take what God is giving and begin to apply it to my life. So they haven't said that the gods that they have served over all these years or those that they worship have had knowledge about had anything to do about with their lives and how they lived their lives. What they just said was that we have gotten great information. Let us never be subject to those that would just say, I read my Bible and I read it every year and I get something new out of it. But is it transforming to our lives? Is it transforming to the things we do and how we live, how we approach life and how we... Uh, expand and grow in our relationship with Him. The Word of God should be pulling at our hearts and drawing us closer, ever closer to Him. And so here are the people there, smart people, great people, great minds, and yet they were looking for the next new thing, that we might have more information, that I might know more than you. But when it comes to the Bible, it's pretty simple that Knowing Christ is the greatest thing that can ever happen to anyone. The question was asked to the person, um, is he the Christ? Is he the one? The person said, I, I, I don't know. All I know is that he told me to pick up my bed and, and walk. All I know, I was lame all these years, and he comes and says, pick up your bed and walk. I picked it up, and I started walking. He could be. I don't know the parents of the son who is blind. Says, so is he the Christ? He says, we don't know, I asked him. And all he knew was that I was blind, but now I see. There ought to be something when we have Christ being presented to us that understand and we who know him, that our lives are being touched and our lives are being transformed with this new thing. Because we're growing daily in him. We're growing in our Christian walk. And so the new thing should be applicable to our lives and in our relationship with Christ, as well as our relationship with one another. But here the people just wanted to know the, the new idea. And then it says, and then Paul stood before the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I can see you are very religious in all things. That's what he said. You're just religious. You're not in a right relationship with God. You're just religious. How many people walk up to you that you have had in your life and they says, well, you know, I'm not religious. And most of our reply to them is, we're not either. We're not religious. We're in a relationship with God. Religious is that we wake up at the same time, eat the same things all, every time and stuff. And so we do this and we've done this and we sleep pr proudly. I've ate like this and I got up at the same time every day for the last 30 years of my life. And I always eat this for breakfast, so I do that religiously. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with a relationship with God. And they were very religious people, but they had no relationship with God. They did not understand. 
So I can say, Paul said to, you, to them, you are very religious in all things. And as I was growing, going through the, your city, I saw the object you worship. You found an altar. I found an altar that had these words written on it, to God who is not known. You worship a God that you didn't, don't know, and this is the God I am telling you about. I like that. Yeah. I like the idea that sometimes we're not sure what to say when people say, well, I, I, I don't really get your Jesus. Well, great. Let me tell you about him. Let me tell you. That's what Paul said to them. Let me tell you about him. You got a lot of questions? Well, the thing I've been talking about all this time is this one that you have been talking about, that you had up there, that you said he's unknown to us, and I've been telling you about him. Him. So let me tell you about this God, the creator of all things, this one who died. I found that altar that had these words written on it, to God who is not known. You worship a God that you do not know, and this is the God I am telling you about. The God who made the whole world and everything in it is the Lord of the land and the sky. He, doesn't, he does not live in temples built by human hands. This God is the one who gives life, breath, and everything else to people. He does not need any help from them. He has everything he needs. God began by making one person, and from him came all the different people who live everywhere in the world. God decided exactly when and where they must live. God wanted them to look for him and perhaps search all around for him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. What a word. Yeah. What a word. That God, what? He had decided exactly when and where we must live, but God wanted them to look for him. Seek him with our whole hearts, that he's desiring us to, to know him, to walk with him. He wants us to, to, to knock on the door. He wants us to, to invite him in. He wants us. He wants us to know him. He stands at the door and knocks. If anyone will open up, he will come in. He will sup with them. And perhaps search all around for him. But if you seek, ask, knock, you will find him. <laughs> though he is not very far from any of us. I thought about the prodigal son when I was reading this, and all I thought about was the fact that he came to his senses. And we think about that he turned and he was going home, but in reality what happens for many of us, when we turn and say, I need to get where I need to be with Christ Jesus, we turn around and boom, he is right there in front of us. You do not have to go around seeking and wondering, where can I find him? Or why? He has promised, I will never leave you. I will not forsake you. I am always there for you. And when we begin to understand that, that God is wanting us, and if he wanted us when we didn't know him, will he not want us now that we do know him as the Lord and Savior of our life? And so he said to them that he is there and he, he wanted them. He wanted to show himself to, to them. He wanted them to look for him then and search for him. And that they would find him because he's not far from any of us. By his power, we live and move and exist. Or as we used to read in the kingdom, and have our being. We are that in Christ Jesus. By his power, we have life, and we move, and, and it's him that directs and guides our life when we allow him to be God. When we understand that we can't do this without him. Some of your own poets, he says, have said, for we are his children. And since we are God's children, you must not think that God is like something that people uh, imagine or make from gold, silver, or rock. In the past, people did not understand God, and he ignored this, but now God tells all people in the world to change their hearts and live. He's drawing us out of the foolishness of life, and I believe that he's wanting all to come because that is his desire. He came that none should perish, that all should have everlasting life, and then it goes on to tell us, God has set a day 
that he will judge all the world with fairness. Fairness. We understand that because why? When judgment came upon that of, of David, or when he had to, was called to accountability for his acts with Bathsheba, that even though he desired God's mercy when he said the child will die, he still reached out to God and, and when that child breathed his last breath, David understood that God was God. And he wasn't angry, he understood that God is God. And he judges the world with fairness. That he's always right, he's always loving, he's always caring. Sometimes we ask that question, God, why, why did you allow this to happen? Why are you punishing us? But we find out that God, if we allow him to minister to us, that he's never punishing us when these things happen. We live in a sinful world and we're born in sinful flesh and we're subject to the sinful things of this world, disease. We're subject to death because sin brings forth death. And if you're not thinking that death is close to you, just live long enough. Just live long enough. And all of a sudden you look in the mirror and you go, oh, who is that in the mirror? Oh, I just want you to know that we're dying daily from the baby who gives his first cry as we get alive that's leading to death. That's what the Lord tells us. And that he lets us know that, that he is a righteous God and he's a loving God, but he will always judge the world with love and he is fair. And by man, uh, he chooses, he chose long ago. And God has proved this to everyone by raising the man from the dead. And when the people heard about Jesus being raised from the dead, some of them laughed, but others said, we will hear more about this from you later. See, everybody doesn't get it when we try to share why we believe uh, um, and talk about Good Friday and, and the Resurrection Sunday. When we talk about his birth and the fact that God would send his son to one day die on the cross for the sin of the world. And they may not understand, they may not get it, and, and, and sometimes it's fearful that a God would love us so much that he would allow his own son to die for a wretch like me. Why would he do that? Why would he want to care about somebody when we think of ourselves many times as we have been the worst of the worst? And if we didn't think it for a long period, maybe at that one moment when you saw yourself and you weren't doing or acting like the child of God that you know that you are. To believe that came out of your mouth or that thought that nobody else knows but you know and how it speaks to your heart. And yet in the midst of that we find that God loves us. And so here he's just letting us know about this God who loves and he cares about. He wants them to know that he's real. He lets them know that you can't carve him out of the rocks. You can't use silver and gold and say, that's God. He says, no, he's the creator of everything. Everything you look at. And then he says, and he's the creator of you. All mankind come from him. Everything that is, that exists, it all comes from him. What he begins to say is that God is God. Because in all of their gods, each one of those gods had a certain uh, uh, Thing that they did and they worship this one for that and worship this one for that and to worship this one but it says here we can worship God the creator of everything the, the God of he said the universe the God who speaks into nothing and calls all things to be we can praise him because why we can know truthfully that nothing exists before him all things exist because of him when we begin to get a picture of that we begin to think about the awesomeness of this God who says, I love you. Some didn't want to hear any of it. And then one other said they wanted to see and hear more later. But some of the people believed Paul and joined him. Among them were who believed was Dionysus. Dionysius. And him too. And, and members of the... You too. You know, I was going to blot all of them out. 
But I think it's good that we know that they're there. And a woman of the merits. And some others. Here in the Word, it just lets us know that Paul said, people are out there, they're looking, they're, they know there's a sense that they know there's a God, but he says, let's give them the truth. See, we don't want people to just go around in blindness. It says that it's time that God wants them to know the truth. He, we don't want people to say, it's okay. If they want to believe that, it's all right. In fact, a, a, a brother was sharing with me uh, recently and just said, you know, I, I used to be okay if that's what you believe, that's what you believe. But he says, I'm at a place in my life now that I can't no longer just say, it's okay. It's okay. Because why? If it's the truth that sets us free, should we not give the truth to others that they may be set free as well? Because, see, you can't ask and seek and, and, and desire to know him if you don't have an idea of where to go with the prayer. I heard all of this, Lord. It doesn't make sense to me. But someone has made it sound like you are the answer. And help me, Lord, that I might know you and, and see you. I believe those prayers are heard. I, I believe that it's said when you seek, you find. If you're not, the door will be open. If you ask, you will it not be given to you. And then in Acts 17, 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And that was the key verse we were going at. But because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about Jesus. And that it knows that God doesn't want man to be ignorant. He wants him to know the truth. And God is not overlooking it now. And now we have the ability for the word of God to go out into all of the world. We were at this leadership meeting and uh, one of the things they, they talked about a, a person from, from Africa and what he wanted to do was that make sure that everyone in that area would be able to have a cell phone. He says we can't run lines like all of the others, but we can hook up towers and everybody can have a phone. They can connect with the world and all of those things and said they fought him. And then he says now tens of thousands over the years now have phones, they're able to connect with the rest of the world. They're out in the jungles of life and yet in the midst of it they can connect. Which means not only can they talk to, but they can get on, they can access stuff. And they can come to hear truth and they can come to hear things that can transform their life. The Word of God is getting out there and lives are being touched and lives are being transformed. And what it takes is just someone to say, Lord, I want people to know, to know, to know. I had an opportunity a few years ago, and I met a group of people, and they, we helped them uh, load in Bibles, and they had cases after cases after cases. And the guy says that I have a printing uh, business, and what I do is I provide Bibles for all over the world, and I put them in other languages. And he says, and we send them out so that people can get the word of God. And he says, you know, he says, um, uh, the business is doing fine because God continues to provide so that we can touch the world. That people can not only get the word of God, but they can get the word of God in their own language. And we had an opportunity of unloading the, the, the trucks and stuff and storing them in there that they could get them out into the uh, areas of the different areas of, of Brooklyn because Brooklyn all of a sudden had Jewish people who were from Russia who needed to have the Word of God written in a language that they could understand and so they were bringing Bibles in what it says here is just letting us know that that God doesn't want men to be ignorant he wants them to know that he is God so the first thing that we talked about is repentance is so important that God commands that all, everywhere, should repent. That he says everyone, 
should come to a place. They should come and, and see God and, and hear about Him and begin to understand in life, I'm not where I need to be, but I want to be. And, and I'm asking God to forgive me. I want, I want to know Him. That I know that what I'm doing isn't right and I, I want to turn from that life. That we begin to repent. And that God is calling all men everywhere to repent. And then we're going to look at that tonight. Everywhere. The lost are to repent. Jesus said, I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. In Matthew 9, 13. Matthew the text collector. It says, as Jesus passed from there. There he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And so he rose and followed him. Now it happened as Jesus sat at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And then Jesus heard that, and he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. You know, I, I, I've lived long enough to understand that the scripture a little clearer, and, and maybe I'm, I'm off a little bit, but I'm going to ask you to help me. But when he says that, I, I, that he came that, you know what? Uh, those who are well have no need for a physician, but those are sick. But when I found out that many people think they're in a good place when they're not in a good place at all. Uh, some people think that they're all right and when they're not all right at all. Some people say that, oh, it's just indigestion and they're having a heart attack and they thought they were all right. People find themselves and they try to push it off. They, they, they think that they're okay. And that's what he was saying to the Pharisees. You don't know how sick you really are, but you think you're okay. And so you have no need for what I'm offering because why? Well, you think you're okay, all right. And again, I always think about that of the, the frog in the, in the water. Yeah. Setting in cold water and he's setting on a fire. And he thinks life is good. <laughs> and then somewhere along the line, somebody says, Mmm, frog is good. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't even know that he was dying, even as the water continued to heat up. He didn't know that he was in a bad place. Sometimes we don't know just how sick we really are until we come to the truth. We didn't know how dark dark was until the light came in. We did not realize how far off the past we had, had been until the light of Christ come into our life. So he said, I came not for those who think they're okay, but I come for them who know they're sick. They know that where they're at is not a good place. They need a physician. And sometimes it takes that to do it. Because why we'll try everything. I, I remember my brother-in-law, he, he scared to death, uh, 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 Paul was scared to death of needles. And I mean, he, he just rough and tough and everything else. But, oh, you pull out a needle and he was just a little baby. And uh, <laughs> Paul was so tough that I remember him taking pliers and pulling his own teeth out. But I also remember the time when he had that infection and he hurt so bad that he pleaded to the doctor, get it out of here. And he didn't care how much they had to shoot him up or whatever he did. He came to a place that he was so sick that he needed help. And he didn't care what it took. Maybe that's where we have to be. Maybe that's who Jesus was talking to when he said those that need a physician. They were at a place in their life that they have been now that everything that they thought would satisfy them didn't satisfy them any longer. All of a sudden they found themselves sicker than they've ever been before. They got sick and tired of being sick and tired. They stopped. They got tired of the struggle of life that they kept saying, I'll get it together. But they find themselves not able to get it together. And so in the scripture, it's just letting us know that he said, I, I, I came for those who need a physician, but those that didn't think they needed a physician, but I came for those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. I, again, when we come to that place of understanding, 
I know what I got coming, but the mercy of God, that that he gives us. Okay. You know, I, I deserve everything I got coming. But thank God for the mercy that he gives us. The mercy that he, he, he lavishes us with. And, and, and he doesn't give us what we deserve. It says, learn what that means. But he's not wanting us just to be sacrificial. You know, I, I'll give this up. I'll, I'll give this up and, and I'll do these things here. We read about Balaam and we read about how that there was uh, the, the, the Balak wanted him to, to curse the, the Israelites and stuff. And he did everything proper. They set up all of the altars. They brought the right meat. They sacrificed the right way. What he's talking about is that heathens even tried to do it the right way. And they even tried to even get it right the wrong way. Because why? If I just go to church, maybe my life will change. I necessarily don't want Jesus, but if I can just get to church, I'll even try that now. I am so desperate right now, I'll even try going to church. I don't believe any of that stuff that they're doing, and I'm just watching them. I'm thinking, all oh, these crazy people, but my life is such a mess, I'm just going to sit here anyway and stuff. And, uh, in fact, I may even come for several weeks and even be part of some of the things, because why? I'm so messed up that if anything will help change my life, but Jesus, I'll take it. And they may come for three months, and then all of a sudden... Their life got a little better because why? When you're hanging out with the right people, you know, it says that if we hang out with the wrong people, it affects us. If you're hanging out with the right people, that'll affect you too. And so if you start to feel a little good for yourself and a little better about yourself, guess what you do? I'm okay now and I'm all right. I can go back out there and I can do it. This time, I, I'm a little wiser. I, I know what to do this time. Now, I don't know about you, but as I said to you, I only did that from 600 to 27, A to Z. Because why I kept thinking, this time I'll be a little better at it because why I got a little more information. That's how they were. They said, I just, let's learn about this other God because why I just love getting information. And that information is really good for a while, but there's nothing in it because why I don't know who it is that is able to transform my life. I don't know who it is that can make a difference in my life. But he tells us we ought to learn these things, know these things. For I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinner to repentance. I always like the fact that in that day they used to talk about this. I know I'm a wretch on down. I know I'm the sinner of sinners, but I ain't no tax collector. That person must have really been a bad person because they said he's setting what what? Tax collectors and sinners. <laughs> How bad are tax collectors? Mm -hmm. They were horrible people because they added more burden upon the people when they didn't have to. They charged them more, collected more from them. And so they were the chief of sinners. They were the worst of the worst. And so maybe, at times, maybe I saw a tax collector when I looked in the mirror. Sometimes we're not where we need to be. But Jesus said, that's the person I come from, came for. So he wants the lost to come to a place of repentance. And then again, Jesus said, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And we read the story uh, just a few weeks ago in Luke uh, 13, verses 3 through 5. And we'll start at verse 1. It talks about repent or perish. There were, they were present at the season some who told him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. For those 18 on whom the Tower of fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you all, you will all likewise perish. 
the importance of repentance. I have to know that I need a physician before my life can begin to change. I have to realize that where I'm at is not a good place. I, I have to be broken in my heart to realize that I, I want to change. Have you ever cried out and wanted a change in your life? That you're tired of being where you're at. You want your life to be different. And you, you try so many things and stuff. And, and then finally one day you cried out to God. Cried out to God. I'm not sure exactly what I was crying out for, but I understood needed him. Because I can't do it on my own. What I'm doing isn't working. It's not working. Somewhere along the line, we have to become bold enough to say to someone, when they tell us they don't need Jesus, it's all right. But how's your life going? Well, it's all right. No, tell me, how's it going? I remember the last time I said that to someone, they found themselves being all choked up, the, the young man did, and the tears began to run down his face and, and all of those things there. And, and he was looking at his life and he says, it's messed up. It's messed up. My question is, uh, what are you going to do to change it? Well, I'm trying all of these things here. And then I asked him the question, did you not try those things before? Because I don't know about you, but when you're messed up, you just keep on doing the same things expecting a different result. When you messed up, you, you don't know anything other than what you know. And if you're not going to someone that can tell you the truth, what you do then is go to another messed up person and say to them, you're less messed up than I am. Can you give me some help? And I'm just going to tell you, messed up people can only give you messed up help. They can't give you truth that sets you free. They can give you their ideas, their schemes, and what they're trying right now. But there's no proof in that pudding, and if you would come back to them months later, they would tell you there was no substance in what I was thinking. We have to come to a place of realizing that we need God, that we need Jesus Christ, that we need a life change that can come to Him somewhere along the line that we have to come to a place to repent of repentance. Of saying, help me, save me. Paul said, I now rejoice that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. And that was the statement that the, the, the little New Testament gave concerning this. But then I had to go deeper because why? There was something that had happened there in Corinth. And it tells us in Corinth in um, chapter 7, 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 7. It said, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of, the, of God. Make room in your hearts for us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have taken advantage of no one. I do not say these, this to condemn you, for I said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Paul is making a commitment to the people and letting them know how important they are to him. And then in verse 8 it says, For even if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. And as it is, I rejoice not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. Truth sometimes hurt. Sometimes when we come to an understanding of where we're at, sometimes the truth hurts. And we're angry for a while that you revealed the truth. And I'm not necessarily angry at you because you revealed the truth to me, but angry because I allowed myself to be in that place. He said, uh, you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you 
suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. We read there and we read it so many times, especially during the season. I'm just talking about that of uh, Passion Week. We talk about Judas and we talk about Peter. We talk about one just felt bad and the other one was broken. One was repented unto salvation, the other one just went out and hung himself. Felt bad. Sorry that I, I did that. Uh, you know, I, but if I had to do all over, I'd do it the same way. You know, I, I just didn't want to see Jesus go through uh, what they're putting me through. So much so that I even gave back the money. I tried to get myself clear of it. And, but there was no repentance in him. Uh, there wasn't a brokenness in him. There was a brokenness in Peter. And so when we look at that, the, the scriptures is letting us know, for godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret. I've never known anyone who comes to Christ, who knows Christ as their personal Savior, begins to live for him and, and live through him ever wakes up one day and say I'm sorry I gave my life to you no not if you allowed him to give you life you're never sorry and none of us have been stoned or beaten we've not been shipwrecked and we've not been well some of you might have been bit by a snake but I haven't been bit by a snake thank you Jesus and uh <laughs> But it says that Paul went through all of those things and he said, when I compare it to my life as living as a good Jewish man, compared to the salvation I found in Christ Jesus, everything that I had before Jesus, I just counted as rubbish. I counted as fertilizer. I counted as that that is lost because why? I got the greater thing. I got Christ. I got his life in me. And if I got to go through some things for Jesus, it's all right because Jesus went through some things for me. It's all right. And then we find that he is there with us no matter what it is. And so if I don't make it out of the fiery furnace, that's all right because why? I, I know that he is with me. Not everybody makes it out of the fiery furnace like the three Hebrew boys. Many people suffered in the furnaces. But we know that God is still with us. Some of us are not healed of our afflictions, but we know that God is still with us. And how do we know that? Because of the consciousness that you see many times when people are transitioning from this life into the next that they have in Christ Jesus. A peace that goes beyond our understanding. There's something about knowing Him. Godly repentance leads to salvation. It comes to a place of, of wanting to, to live and thanking Him for dying for us and that we might have life in him and so it says that Paul was encouraged by that he was encouraging them and he was letting them know that um, you suffered for a little while and then it talked about what they suffered what they suffered about and in 1 Corinthians 5 verses 1 through 13 we, we recognize what it is it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you as a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. Oh, wait a minute, I, I thought we're not to judge nobody. But every now and then when you get the log out of your own eye, you can begin to see clearly about the speck in your brother's eye, and you begin to tell your brother you got a speck in your eye. But we run with them in the midst of it. He said that I, 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 because I am a, uh, an elder, I, I have been called, I'm an apostle uh, uh, in, in, in the body of Christ Jesus, that I will say these things to you. And so he began to speak to them. He said, let him be who has done this be removed from among you. 
For though absent in body, I am present in spirit. And that the Spirit of God was leading him, directing him to share these things with him, with them. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. And when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. What is he saying? What is he saying? <clears throat> now I know that, well nobody in this room may have told somebody, you can go straight to. But you really weren't thinking that you had power to cast them into hell. But here he says, I'm just going to turn this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. What is he saying to us, anybody? Some sins are sins to the death. What's that? Some sins are sins to the death. Some sins lead to death. Yeah. yeah. I believe it's saying that he's be removed from the believer's midst, you know, and left to destruction of his flesh to be uh, in the hands of Satan, you know, for whatever Satan to do to him to, in the hopes that that would bring him around to repentance. Excellent. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is, just what you said, you know. Sin can look this way. The Israelite children were out in the wilderness. They're complaining because they're eating a lot of manna and they, they want some more and, and they want some quail. And they, they wanted some meat. They wanted some quail. And so God gave them enough quail that it said it began to run out their nose. <laughs> when he did, okay, you, you want it? I'll give it to you. I'll let you have it. You can eat on this. Now, ham in our family was to quail. I don't care how much you cut off that ham, there'll be just as much the next day when you got back. And the first Sunday night, Sunday after church, it was great. <coughs> and then you had ham for, and eggs for breakfast, and then you had ham cut up, and you had it for a sandwich to take to school with you. And then you came home, and after a while, they, they chopped up the ham, and they put it there. And then when they got done with that, they threw the bone in some beans. You had ham for over a month. <laughs> <laughs> He said, turn this man over. If he wants to run in the flesh, let him run in the flesh. If you run long enough in the flesh, you'll get tired of being tired. He said, let this man know, because why? He knows the truth. Isn't that what happened to the prodigal son? He ran long enough in the flesh. That even then, they, he couldn't, they didn't offer him the food that they were given to the hogs. And he was hungry. And they didn't even say, here, you can go here and eat some of that too. Don't you eat none of that. Give it to the hogs. That he come to a place I came to my senses. That's what he's saying. Let him run. Let him run in his flesh. Let the enemy have his way with him. That he may come to his senses. That he may come to a place. And that even if this flesh is destroyed, he himself will be saved. He himself is. Could that be then that Everything you've done has been burned up. But you yourself have been saved. So he said to them, destruction for Satan to turn this, deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on in verse 9 and says, I wrote you to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people not at all meaning the sexual Im immoral, immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters since then you would need to go out of this world I like the fact in this scripture and I don't know I've read it a, 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 a lot of times over the years but the clarity of it here was that I'm not telling you not to go out and preach the word to them who don't know Jesus. I'm not asking you not to be light to them that don't know. 
that you find yourself that uh, they were down in Houston. I was just talking to a man that they're still doing a lot of work for, from the flooding that happened through the hur hurricane there in Houston. And he said, and we're working with some Christians, but we're also dealing with a lot of sinners. And the Christians are going into their, their areas and helping to restore and build. And they're asking the question, why would you care? Why would you care? He's saying, that's, that's what we're going to do. He said, I'm not telling you not to, to do out, go out there where the sinners are at. I'm not telling you not to be Christ before them. I'm not telling you to do that when I told you not to be with sexual immor immoral people, immoral people. He says, I'm telling you, I'm not talking about the world. I'm just talking about within the body. But now that I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or deeds or in is an idolater what is that? Which is? Oh, you can spell but Oh, I can't give you the definition. Help me out, somebody. I'm sorry, I was distracted. A lady behind you was going to ask a question. I had a question. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, sexually immoral people, is that, would that be like homosexuality? Yeah. Yeah. No. No, 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 no. That are, no, that's not like what we're getting in the headlines now. No, no, what I'm saying, what it's saying is that things that are not of God. Yes. There's things that God has laid out, has made it clear. When we look in the Old Testament, he turns it out, he spells it out pretty clear, what we ought not to do. And it says that you should not be with your, your, your uh, uh, brother's wife, you should not be with your uncle's wife, you should not be this here, you should not do this here, and if you do this here, this here won't happen, and all those things there. He said that should not be in the body of Christ. He said that may be out there in the world. He said that we're still going to be light and go out to the world and, and share with them and, 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 and let them know the truth that will set them free. But he says in the body of Christ, we, we have to deal with things. Now I won't tell you. When I look at scriptures like that, I wish it was somebody else teaching it. Because what it's saying is that when you're in leadership, when you're in, in positions that you have to deal with things in there, which you said to them, by what judgment you are judging them, you also will be judged. So that means also that if you say this to one and 20 are listening, you fall in the same trap. If you threw the rock there, guess what? You get 20 rocks <clears> back at you. So sometimes it's a hindrance that, do I want to speak it out? Because why? If I speak it out, then people are going to be looking at me, but we're to speak it out. We're called to walk accountable to God. So you said what was uh, reviled? Reviled. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So it says um, to subject to verbal abuse, and then it gives an example, to revile to a citizen in an abusive or hostile way, or to spread negative information about mm. bad gossip. Verbally gossipers. attack someone and mm -hmm. call his name and say, uh, say mean things. This is an example of a time when you are reviled. Yeah, okay, all right. So you're not to beat somebody down with your lips. You're not to do that. You're not to tear people apart. Don't yes, sir. Yes, yes, yes. No? So don't eat me for such a person. Yeah. So it tells us that the drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. <laughs> but I like the idea that he's just saying it's not just sexual immorality is talking about when someone is in a place and won't come out of it. Now, I, I, I don't know. Your parents said to you about the people you hang out with. You may not be doing what they're doing, but if you hang out with them long enough, everybody's going to think you're doing the same thing. Where, where does unforgiveness fit in on that then? Kind of it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. First, he talked about what said you're you're turning him over. Why? Because why? If you don't want to run with us, and how can you run with us if this is labeled on you? Many many years ago, I was in a position, and someone said, "Why don't you take this person to the prison?" I said, "I can't take that person to the prison with me to to share because why? I know where this man is at." 
I, I, I know where he's at, I, I know what he's into, and I, I can't do that. I can't bring him in there to speak to men as if he's coming off like that. No, if you want him to run with you, you run with him. But I'm not going to run with him. And, and, and that's the decision, but it wasn't that I didn't love him. I still fellowship with him, I still speak to him and those things there. But in that time of ministry in his life, it was not about the things of the Lord. He liked it. He liked what people said about him. He, he, it was not about the glorifying God. It was what he could get because people thought this man of God is so. They gave him money. They gave him this. They gave him that. He, they did all of these things. And those things hindered him. They kept him in the trap. So it wasn't that love is that love is coming. But he says, first of all, if you love your children, do you let them continue to slide down a, a, a slippery road? And they may say, you don't love me. You don't love me. Why, why are you not helping me? Why, are you, why won't you give me this? Because why I can't enable you in, in this situation where you're at in your life. You see, some would say, you don't love. He'd say that he didn't love, but you say, because I love you, I'm not going to give you this. We show people love many times when we'll give them food, but we won't give them money because why we'll go into drugs and, and alcohol. That's right. so, so love comes out sometimes that looks hard. But he wasn't saying that we didn't love him. Tough love. He was, tough love is what they call it today. But what he was saying was that because why, and he's going to explain it a little later, uh, that why we do this, uh, it says not even uh, eat with such a one, for what have I to do with judging the outsiders? So he says, let us know we're not talking about what the world's doing. We're talking about what's going on in the body of Christ. It is not those inside the church who you are it, it is not those inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside. So we're to deal with that that we're dealing with in the body of Christ. But God deals with man who's apart from him. First the evil person from among you. Now, it's only if they come back and yes. repent yes. the forgiveness. Yes, yes, yes. They got that So then, um, he teaches us in 2 Corinthians, we find in chapter 2, verses 11, 1 through 11, and um, it says, For I made up my mind not to make any another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pain? What he's saying is that we're connected here, I and, and I love you, and I and I and I know you love me, and I, I don't want to cause you pain, uh, but I, I want to make you glad. I I don't want to continue to have this between us, but I'm standing on the things that I, I I told you to do. For if I cause you some pain, who is there to make me glad? He wants them to know that I still love you, but the one whom I have pain. And I wrote as I did, so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. Sometimes we get stuck in a place we're not sure what we ought to do, what we ought to say, and it continues to cause havoc because nobody says anything. But he spoke up and told them what they needed to do. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all, that if we walk this out completely, you'll see that what I'm saying for you to do back then, you'll see how God has caused it to work out for us. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundance of love that I have for you. This hurts me too. So when we're hearing that, that's the parent that says, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Yeah. That's what he was saying. That's what he's saying. That's what they were meaning at that time. So when you're the one on the receiving end of the belt, you can't figure out how can that hurt them more than it's hurting me. I think most parents have said that at some time or other. Yeah. Now, if anyone has caused pain, 
He has caused it not to me, but in some measure not to put it too severely to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. It says that this person had come to a place of repentance, and now it's time for us to embrace him. It's time for us to, to love him, encourage him, so that we don't, you know, I'm doing, I, I, I've repented, I've done everything, and, and yet you still won't let me eat with you, won't let me fellowship with you. Uh, you know, it's been months, and, uh, and it's been months, and it's been months, and it's been months, and... Uh, and, and it's not that he was begging them, but I'm saying he's still doing it. And Paul is saying somewhere along the line we have to begin to embrace because why? We will beat them down. It is not about we beat them down and then we, we put something else new into them. No, he says, no, there comes a place where godly sorrow brings repentance. I have a question there. Yes. And it's usually with family members and that, but... Um, I'll just use my brother for, I mean, a lot of you know the, his life situation. You know, he repents and, you know, I'm sorry and, you know, I'm going to straighten up for a while. And they go along, slip back, repent again. This goes, you know, this cycle goes on and on. Do you think that they're truly repenting from the first, first time that it happens? I'll mail somebody. I think we have to be careful with that. And they what did you have, say? They're weak. They don't have the strength to follow through with it. Okay. So, so then we can be sorrowful. And we already talked about that. Sorrowful is not repentance. I, I, I feel bad. I've hurt you. Aiding them by, by helping them, aiding them as you forgive them and they, or give them money or whatever to go, you know, mm -hmm. fall back in it. And, and, and you're right. And what were you saying, Kyle? I was just thinking that we need we have to be careful with it because we all have sin mm -hmm. uh, that plague us. You know, we'll struggle with our whole lives. Some of the same things that we'll have to continually go to the Lord for mm -hmm. uh, in forgiveness. But there is that other side of the line. You know, if you are doing maybe some of those outright things, which I don't know your brother, um, and continuing to just go back to those same things over and over and over again, I would have to say it'd be unlikely that would be true repentance. But somewhere in between that and well, he's and an alcoholic, so I mean, that, the, the disease. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, they're dealing with a whole different, you know. You know, and, 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 and because we love, we, we really want to. And then one day you hear someone say to us with the, the men over there at uh, Victory Acres, and, and one of the things that I heard many of them say, the same thing that I said, you know, that after a while it feels like they don't love you because they've reached out so many mm -hmm. times to us. And we just disappoint them, disappoint them. And it wasn't that they don't love us, they're afraid now. They're, just, they're afraid to open up their hearts again because why? They're, they're thinking that we'll trample over them. And, and we understand that. And we're coming to that place just now. Isn't that like, like God feels then about us at times? Because, you know, we slide back and then we go back, you know, and, and God's ready for us. He's got his open arms for us. So, yeah, and I understand that yeah, God gives us the grace and, and those things there, and his heart is broken. It, it says that, he puts it in a term uh, when he was dealing with Israel, that, that, they, that, they, that they did that, you know. Um, and to the point that he said, you know, uh, Moses, I'm going to start something with you. you know? I'm just going to start with you. I'm getting rid of all of these. Now, wait a minute, you can't do that. <laughs> Dad, you don't want to do that. What would all the other people say? God wasn't going to do that because why? He's faithful to his promises. But yes, he wants us to do right. Jesus wept, wept over Israel because why? The promises of God were given there. And so God in flesh, his heart was broken because why? They didn't see. They were hailing him as the, the king. Scripture is being fulfilled, and yet they're plotting to kill him, and they don't see it, and they don't, the, the leaders don't see it. 
They don't, they don't see it. They, they deny it. And we know that the Word of God says that he blinded them. But we also know that Scripture tells us that some of the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, we know. Because no one can do these things if they come from God. And then we know Joseph of Arimathea. We know that the others came and uh, uh, was uh, there and they believed Jesus. They, Nicodemus, they believed Jesus. And so, so we know that though they, the nation was blind, the leadership was blind, people were still coming to know Christ as their personal Savior. They were coming to know the truth of God's Word. And so, yes, it, it is hard, Sarah, because why? Because there ought to be some fruit, the Word tells us, fruit of repentance. And then the Word of God tells us there ought to be some fruit that we do in Christ Jesus that what? ought to remain. Ought to remain. There ought to be some life-giving uh, part that comes out of us. But Kyle is right. He says to, he says to Paul, uh, you, you don't, don't bring this to me anymore. Yeah, yeah, I know you prayed three times, but my grace is sufficient. And, and the thing that he was dealing with, that he was dealing with, and, and, and he's saying, my grace, not, not towards Paul, but my grace to them is sufficient. I will give them my grace. Now, we, we call that many things, and you can go look at that, and there will be um, a, a lot of people in their opinion what that is. I, I have one, and I'm probably right, and that uh, <laughs> have no more idea than the others. But Paul's love for the Jewish people was so great that he even said, Lord, I'd make myself a curse. That I, I would go into, if, if they would come to it, I'd give up what I know for it. If they would be. But we know Jesus has already done that. We know that Christ has already done that. God has a plan and the plan is going to be fulfilled. He already lets us know and Paul writes later that through the Holy Spirit that they'll be grafted back into the tree because if he can take a wild olive branch like us and put us in, surely he'll take one that came from the tree and put it in and that they should be made whole. And so um, we see these things happen and God does. Um, he wants his children to do well. He wants us to do well. Uh, I have plans for you uh, to that you do good, that you do well, not that you fail, but that you will succeed. He has plans for our lives, and so when we're looking at that, yes, uh, uh, God is moved, and and yes, and there is that place. But again, we keep praying, we keep hoping, we keep doing those things there that that are needed. Uh, a man recently said to me. Uh, I said some things to him a few years ago and stuff, and, and in the past year, what you need to do is probably go to, um, let's see, uh, the ministry that... Uh, al -Anon. No, no, it's uh, over in Peoria. They got it now out in New York and stuff. I'm, I'm running a blank. Um, um, it's, you go there and you live for a year. Is there a rescue mission? Well, it's not the rescue mission, but it is... Uh, it's a ministry that allows people to come get their lives together. You commit to a year, and you go out to Pennsylvania, and you'll live there and stuff. And, and it's just, uh, uh, David Wilkerson was uh, uh, part of uh, Teen, Teen Challenge. Teen Challenge. And, uh, and they, their ministry uh, says that 80-something uh, percent of the people that have gone through there, they keep record of them, and they're still running after the things of the Lord. And so it, it seems to work. I tried to share this. I ain't doing that. I ain't doing that. I, I, I can't do that. I, I can't leave my family. I can't. You're tearing your family apart. You, you need to get this together. But I was just told the other day that not only is that, but um, he's going to do uh, X amount of days, and then he's going into a program that he'll be in, in part of for the next year. Um, Victory Acres is a nine-month program. And their hope is when you get through with the nine months program that you go back to the rescue mission because that's where they're brought from. And, and then you'll work and then get yourself back into the workplace and, and stay for another. So they have a year program as well uh, that, that helps and, and stuff for people's lives to be changed. Give them an opportunity, they, they're around them. And they, they, those things are life changing. And so what, what I'm saying is that if you're really wanting help, you need a physician, you go to the doctor. You go to the doctor. You know, it's not enough to say, I'm sorry. If, if I'm broke, let's get fixed. Uh, if, if the muffler, if the car is a wreck, let's, let's, get, let's get it tuned up, let's get it ready to, so it can run. 
And, and, and so those are the things that we need to see. There ought to be that desire then to change, to move forward in the, in the things that God would have for our lives when we come to a place of repentance. Sometimes it's not the family that can be a part of that. It's, it has to be programs yeah. that's, that helps. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you can. You, but somewhere along the line, I have to make a choice to want that. You know, I have to see that this is better for me to do this. And so I'll be gone for a little while, but then I'll get to stay forever. Right. Ever. I, I went through this for a little while, but, but you won't see me falling off in the next year or the next few months. I, I'm running strong. I, I got years behind me now. I was only gone for a year, but I've been here at everything now for the last 10 years. And it makes it so hard when they go away like that to get the help they need. And they come back to a family that they left that was so dysfunctional that doesn't get any help. Yeah. And then it's so easy to fall back into that. Mm -hmm. So we have to make our mind up that we're going to be strong in God. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we have to distance ourselves from them. Yeah. That's right. And, and that's, that's hard. That's hard. And that it's going to happen in the last days. You know, our families are going to turn against us and we're going to have to step away from some of the things that Mm -hmm. Church mm -hmm. it's harder now for families to uh, hang together forever I'd like than it was. I know uh, when I was Reverend Bailey's age, the world wasn't that in the shape it is now. Now, and I feel I wonder <laughs> what <laughs> if I'll live long enough to to see anything get better. We may not see the world get better, but we can see people get better. We can see lives change and get better. We, we, can, we can see that. The church. Well, this, church, this country is getting more and more, uh, what's the word to look for? Um, morally. You know, but we can blame it on the country, but people, let's not say the country, people. It's the people. It all comes out of man's heart. It's all in man's heart. People, people change. So here, when he's telling us this here, he says, now, if I cause you some pain, he says, I don't know, if I cause you some pain during this time, um, in verse 5, now if, I, now if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely to all of you. Such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive, and that's what Tracy was asking about, and comfort him, or he will be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Oh, when I read that, he says, you know, we're making choices every day, and they're tough choices as believers in Christ. And that's what you were talking about, tough choices. But he's saying, if you're not willing to make the tough choice, you don't allow the Holy Spirit an opportunity to minister into those things. If I keep patting you on the head and telling you, it's all right, baby, it's okay. You, you just go ahead and do it. It's all right. You know mama loves you, daddy loves you. It's okay. It's, it's all right. No. No, because if you continue to do that, you have to put bars on your door, bars on your window, because they will come in and they will take your stuff and they will sell everything you got. Yep. They will do that. Right. Um, somewhere along the line, we have to say, I love you, but... But we, we can't do this. We can't do this. We can't do this. And it doesn't mean that you don't want that. It means that unless there's a change, unless there's a, and so there was a time period, there was a fruit of, 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 of sincerity in his heart. Because there was a difference because why? Somebody may have said something to him. And maybe they just thought he would get it. I'll throw a hand out there. Maybe he'll get it. Maybe he'll we'll say, man, you know, you know, you ought to change some things and stuff. But Paul made it clear why we don't do these things. And the other wanted them to know that if you don't deal with that, don't you know that a little leaven will spoil the whole loaf? Mm -hmm. If 
you don't deal with some things there, but all of a sudden we all become melancholy. We all become just a little uh, laxed in the things that we're, we're doing. We're, uh, we, we begin to say everything's okay. And the next thing you know, we have ourselves in such a fix that we're not sure then how to get out. And sometimes we can get in that fix because there's nobody saying, we got to stop this. We have to do something. And it's a tough decision. Nobody wants to be the bad guy, but he's not saying that. He said, well, we love enough that we're willing to say, we'll be tough for a while. Tough love, I heard you say. I'll be tough for a while. Because why? In the end, in the end, the heart is seeking it. They'll get where they need to be. Yes, sir. Uh, an open rebuke is better than hidden love. Yeah. Proper. Yeah. There's no such thing as hidden love. <laughs> you guys have studied that, didn't you? you? An open rebuke is better than hidden love. Yeah, amen. 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 It hurts, it stings. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you. That he was letting him see, you know, are we going to be about the things of the Lord or are we not? You know whether or not you are obedient in everything. Christian walk, we like to pick the good things. We don't want to deal with the tough things that are in life. But he's saying there's tough decisions we have to make if we really love people that are in the body of Christ. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. He was like, no, no, I made the tough decision, but I'm just waiting. I, I'm ready to do this, but I had to have you come to a place that you're ready. And indeed, what I have forgiven... If I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ. So that we would not be outwitted by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his designs. Or his, not ignorant of his devices. Yes? How many times do we forgive him? Um, Infinity. 70 times 7, yeah. Yeah. And so what he's saying to us, and, and, and let us know that, yeah, we did this. We recognize this because why? I love the body of Christ, and if we don't deal with this, then we'll have more trouble. And, and so we need to correct this thing as soon as possible. How many times have you waited too long before you went to the doctor? Huh? I'll get better. I'll, I'm going to be okay. I'm and then we're sitting in there, we're dehydrated, they got things in our arm, this and that and the other. We don't want to be in there. I'll go on. Now they got a catheter in there, they got this going on, they got all of these things going on. We could have went three weeks earlier and just got a shot. Yeah. Yeah. Took some medicine and then. That's a man's thing. That's what Miss Ray said. That's a man's thing. That's a man's thing. Well, I got a stubborn wife that is like that. That, that doesn't get there soon enough. But she's getting wiser. Yes. And so what, what we're seeing is that what? That it says forgiveness to the sinner. That he's wanting us to know that repentance, is, as we looked at tonight, is just not for the unsaved or, or those things that are for the saved, but it's also for the unsaved and then there's repentance for the backslider. There's repentance for the lost. That God's repentance, that the Spirit is speaking to, to many. And so as we stop there tonight, let us be mindful of the fact that what you said out of this here was that in ministry, no matter what we're doing, that we're doing it in the love of God. And especially when you understand the struggle that they're going through because it's tough. And I like the fact that Kyle said, I hope you heard it. Some things are being tweaked in our life for the rest of our life. And we're victorious in it because we have to depend on him who is able to save them. And you say, what? Well, if I lose sight for one moment, there I am again. And you think, how did you walk freely and all these other things and those things there? Because he says, my grace is sufficient. I'll give you everything you need to be victorious. Lord, I'd like it. You took this away from me. You took this away from me. You took that away from me. Why do I have to continue to deal with this? Because you need to know that I'm God and you need me. You need me. 
He said, but what are you complaining about? You got victory, didn't you? But Lord, it's hard. You get victory, right? And so if you get victory and you know that it's hard, you'll also give grace to others because why? They're going through the same hard battles that you're going through. It may not be the same thing, but they're facing the same situation. Temptation is there. And we have to learn how to stand strong in the things of the Lord. We thank God tonight for your input on the Word of God that we're looking at this. And uh, because it, it isn't about just uh, we say a few words and those things there and then everything's a okay. Paul said that he's letting us know there ought to be a change. Repentance brings forth a change in, in people's hearts and in their lives. And sometimes as we're seeing them come to that and they're sorrowful and those things there, we have to begin to instruct them on things that they need to do to, to help. And sometimes in the cases it may be what you're listening to and, and what you're watching. You know, and stuff we pour into ourselves can keep us right trapped up in our in our life situation. And so there's a lot of things that are out there. But the Word of God will guide us and direct us that we not only can begin to walk in, in, in the strength of Christ, but we can also be encouragers that others can know they can walk in it too. Amen. Did everyone get a chance to sign tonight that uh, prayer request was? Did you guys get it? Oh, they did? They did. Yeah. You know, I hate to keep, but what if you forgive a person and then they expect you to, that one forgiveness, to forgive everything that keeps following? Well, you know, um, you well, know, they'll say, wait, you forgave me. Well, you, <laughs> and know, and keep... you know, the bottom line is, is that forgiveness means if you're telling me that you're changing, I expect to see change. Yeah. Yeah. I expect to see some change. Mm -hmm. You know, and so somewhere along the line, it's tough. Mm -hmm. I've had to break relationships because why? I just can't run this with you. Mm -hmm. I can't run this with you. You're asking me to, to continue to tell you it's okay and I'll be there for you. Somewhere along the line, you have to say, oh, I don't want that. So um, you're paining me and I'm hurting. And, and I tell people, when, with counseling and sharing with others. If I'm working harder at this than you are, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. If I'm fighting harder to get you where you want to be, where you say you want to be, something's wrong. You ought to be running hard after it yourself. And it may not that you know how to run uh, uh, as fast as, as, as the next person, but we can start out walking. I, I just need to see you get up and do something. Get up and do something. Somewhere along the line, I have to begin to want the change to happen. And and if not, then, then as I said about the one gentleman, we can't run together. Because you really don't want the same things that we're running after. And it isn't that we didn't care about him and we ministered with him still over the years and stuff to him. But we couldn't run with him because of where he was at. Because I would say to him that we're okay with what you're doing and we weren't okay with it. And we didn't just say that to others, we said that to him. You know, we, we just can't do that. I can't take you to the prison where you're at because they don't know what you're doing, but everybody in town does. And you're out there trying to be this, and you're not that. So, brother, you just change, get it right. And, and we'll run together, we'll run together. And so those are tough decisions, those are things to do. There were some family members that we had to come to a place and say, you know, uh, you can come to my house, I won't be going to yours. Because yeah. what they do, what they do in their house, can't do. So when you come to my house, you can't do that. So you're welcome here, but we won't be going there. And, and it's all right. And, and if it offends and those things you don't, well, we ain't come to yours, then that's the choice you make. But I'm making a choice. I, I, I can't just go and, and do what you and say what you're doing is okay and bring my family and myself into that. I can't do that. I can't do that. And so it's, it's tough, but God will give us exactly what we need to get through. He will show us through his word how to do this. That you won't find yourself saying, well, I think, no, Paul said, I know. This is what we need to do. Why? Because if we don't, this leaven will begin to spread through the rest of us. And we have to do this. We have to do this.
and we find out that it, it worked. It worked. Imagine that God's got a plan and his plan works. Yeah. Because why? He leaves the 99 to go after the one. So he wanted that man just as bad as Paul wanted to see him get there. But sometimes we have to stew with it. Don't have to. Hopefully we get out of it quicker. And I hope that when you said that we may struggle with it, maybe my rebound is quicker, quicker, quicker. I'm getting faster at it. It doesn't take six months now. It doesn't take a, this long to, to get come to my senses again. I don't have to stay out there that long before. We're getting there. We're getting there. And each one of those times, God's making us stronger. Making us stronger. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. We do thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, and we know that you are true. And because, Lord, you give us words, Lord, about imperfect Christians saved by grace. Not of any work that we can boast, Lord, of anything that is in us that makes us right. But it's by grace alone we have been saved. Lord, I thank you tonight, Lord, that you don't paint the body of Christ and, and Christians as they're perfect now in everything they do. No, you tell us that we're growing from babies to children to young men and hopefully to fathers to women, mothers and in the faith. Lord, I pray tonight, dear Heavenly Father, that we will strive to grow in our relationship with you. And then, Lord, in those areas of the Lord where we are weak, Lord, let us begin to resist. Resist, Lord. Resist, Lord, as hard as it might be, Lord. To know, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we shall reap a harvest if we faint not. And so, Lord, I thank you tonight, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you for the grace that you give. We thank you, Lord, for the love you pour out upon us. But I thank you, Lord, that your word is that you're desiring us to grow and move in you from glory to glory to glory. And I thank you tonight, Lord, for my brothers and sisters. Go with us, be with us. Ask your blessing, Lord, upon those, Lord, that are the prayer request tonight, Lord, that you would touch, move, Lord, in the ways that are needed, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that we might, Lord, see lives changed, Lord, families changed, Lord, people coming to a saving knowledge, Lord, of who you are, that they're not just getting information, but they're looking for life change that only you can give. And Lord, and we will give you all the praise, give you all the glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.